Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Broad from Deep Knowledge Investing. We work with hedge funds, family offices, registered investment advisors, and individuals like you to help you get better returns in the stock market. I'm here with our host, Rob Farian, the CEO and founder of Flying V Group. They are our digital marketing partner. Rob, how are you doing this week? I am doing great, Gary. Happy Memorial Day to you. To you as well. Yeah. Uh, I am uh, in honor. I'm wearing my out of office hat, but funny we're in the office, but this just goes to show that rain or shine, holiday, <laughs> not holiday, DKI is here to provide you with the news that you need in the financial market. So we're excited to be here. Right. Whether we're in the office or out of the office, we're in the office. That's I think right. that's the message. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's exactly right. But there, there's your takeaway. Anyways, uh, and we also have an incredible issue, which the title of the issue caught my eye, the most important issue ever issue, Yes, which is great. It's great. So we are going to talk Enrique Abeda. Uh, we had him on a week, two weeks ago. Gary, you've been doing a lot with him. We're talking NVIDIA again, Target, uh, commercial real estate and environmental and social goals and what those mean for certain companies. So uh, Gary, you ready to dive right in? And I think we have one round of applause. Uh, Andrew, our intern, he finished his final exams, I believe. That's right. All right. So Andrew, congratulations on yeah. that. And, well. and not not only did he finish his exams, now that he's done, uh, he was a massive contributor to this week's five things. Um, he was the one who picked all five of the things. He got the images, did a ton of the writing. Um, I mean, really great job by him. Uh, you know, for our younger viewers, this is how you start to build a career. I mean, he just finished his sophomore year, at the University of Tennessee, but he's a meaningful contributor to this week's five things. Round of applause. Great job, Andrew. Yeah, well done, Andrew. All right. So jumping right in uh, this week's five things, we're at thing number one with Gary Broad, Deep Knowledge Investing, uh, DKI host Enrique Abeda on Talon Energy. Gary, we're talking about ticker is TL. N E. Tell us yeah. more about that. Yeah, last week we hosted a webinar with Enrique. It's it's up here on YouTube. Uh, so feel free to check it out. But we were talking about talent energy. The the ticker, as Rob said, is TLNE. Um, Enrique made the case that the stock, even though it's up uh substantially from where he and his firm HX Research first recommended it, uh, he thinks it's a double from here. And um you know, one of the arguments that people make that I don't like, a lot of times, you know, you say, hey, I'd like the stock and somebody will take a look at the chart. They'll see that's up and they'll say, oh, I missed it. Uh, great. Except there are stocks that go up 3x, 4x, 5x, 10x. And Enrique's point is for a stock to go up three or four or five or 10 times its stock price, it first has to double. And mm -hmm. so his point is, hey, the stock is doubled and he thinks it will double again. Um he did a great job of breaking down the opportunity in the stock, talking about what happened as it came out of bankruptcy, the refinancing. And they recently uh, sold a data, a, a data center to Amazon. And Amazon is going to be, uh, they, they signed a contract to buy power from Talent oh. Energy, which runs one of the largest nuclear plants in the United States. Um, Enrique thinks that that a talent Susquehanna plant is worth somewhere between 24 and $30 billion. And the stock's enterprise value is $7 billion. So just on that alone, there's huge opportunity. Seems like some of the catalysts built into what you're saying right there, Gary, but what are both short long-term catalysts for the position? And then I'd also like to ask how closely uh, is talent aligned with uh, DKI's uranium position? Well, that that's the key thing, Rob. You know, everybody's very excited about this whole AI revolution, the opportunities in artificial intelligence. And the thing that people are just starting to realize is all of those graphics cards from NVIDIA, right? All of those data centers use up massive amounts of electricity. Um, AI in particular, because it has to do a lot of instant calculations, is a power intensive application. And so Nuclear energy is basically the cheapest baseload energy that you can produce for people who are concerned about carbon. It is it's not it releases no carbon into the atmosphere. So it's a great option. It's also extremely reliable, which is why Amazon wants it for their plants. A lot of other data centers are starting to locate themselves close to um, 
a nuclear power and they're bidding up, they're paying to have access to that reliable base, base load generation, which also helps them. They get to say that they're generating their energy from non-carbon based sources. Um, and so that's really the opportunity there. Now at Deep Knowledge Investing, we've been huge fans of owning the physical uranium that I think is the best play on it. But Enrique's case for talent, I, I think is outstanding. I ended up buying a small position in it personally. Um, you know, on the back of the great work that he did there. And, uh, you know, our view is we're going to continue to own large amounts of uranium uh, because demand is outstripping supply and the dollar is losing purchasing power. That's a, Those are both two great elements of a thesis, but this AI data center revolution means there's going to be more demand for more power and more baseload generation going forward. This is a great way to play it. Great stuff coming from Enrique, and we thank him for being on the show and also just that partnership with HX Research and working alongside one another. Uh, Gary, great stuff having him on. Uh, thing number two, we're moving to NVIDIA. NVIDIA delivers the most important earnings call ever for now. Yeah, so this is, uh, it's become a meme, and it's why we call this particular issue the most important what, wait, what do we call it, Rob? We call it the uh, the most important issue, issue ever, ever issue, issue, right? <laughs> and, it, and it's become, you know, sort of this running meme. Every time NVIDIA announces earnings, people, you know, they say, they, oh my God, this is going to be the most important earnings report of our lifetime. And, you know, it's kind of a funny thing. But in the meantime, this is a company with the very best product and enormous growth in the fastest growing part of the market. So it's one of those weird combinations where you have a clear market leader um, with not, there's competition coming, but it's not at their level yet. Um, and, you know, this, this AI revolution is like the same thing we saw 30 years ago in the beginning of the internet business. And, you know, then it was Cisco selling the, the hardware that people wanted to own. Um, Nortel as well, you know, uh, JDS Uniphase, those were the companies that were really big at that time. And, you know, they haven't done well long-term, but they certainly did really well into that kind of um, expansion of the market. And, you know, NVIDIA, again, did not disappoint. They have had phenomenal growth in revenue and earnings. Again, they beat expectations. They announced a stock split, which is necessary. Now the stock is trading over $1,000 a share. They uh, more than doubled their dividend from four cents to ten cents. Um, they they just you know they continue to raise the bar every single quarter. It's incredible to watch. Gary, with as much of Nvidia being the driver behind the positive S and P returns, I mean, do we have any potential here? Stock bubble, some might call it, uh, just in terms of how much other companies are being buoyed by Nvidia's performance. That's a great question, Rob. And one of the things that, you know, so we were joking before that, you know, the most important earnings report ever, except, you know, it's fun to make fun of, but here's the, the truth. The truth is that this company has been responsible for a huge percentage of the S&P 500's increase over the last two years, right? They were one of seven companies that drove the, the market up. Last year, I, I saw somewhere... Uh, that this company has been responsible for more than 30% of the rise in the S&P 500. So you got, you know, 499 companies driving the market, you know, roughly 65% and one company doing, you know, over one third of, um, of the lifting there. The, what will be interesting is to see what happens with the other AI related companies, because, you know, we were just talking before, about the companies that were big in the early days of the internet, the hardware sellers, right? Nortel, JDS, Uniphase, uh, Cisco. And those stocks, they were great for a while, but it was a huge bubble. And when the demand dried up, the, the stocks got hammered and not everybody stayed in business. And so it'll be, I, I think, you know, NVIDIA is well positioned for years. It'll be interesting to see what happens to some of the other companies. And, you know, Rob, some of the companies involved here aren't pure play bets. So, you know, for instance, AMD is coming out with their own graphics processors. Um, Samsung has their own line. You know, it'll work or it won't. 
but one, it's hard to imagine that Samsung is um, is going to produce bad product. But even if they do, it's not going to take the company under. So it'll be interesting to see what happens um, on some of the valuations for the other companies in the sector. Great stuff, Gary. Thing number three, we're moving to Target, ticker TGP, and watch sales disagree on the economy. So we got Target paired up with, I'm assuming we're talking more luxury yeah. watch sales and that market. Yeah. Well, Rob, you know, one of the debates I've been having with people on Twitter, and, and these are smart people, they're, you know, they're great strategists, they're great macro analysts. But one of the debates that I've been having is they're saying the economy is in great shape. And they're looking at aggregate data. They're looking at uh, the CPI coming down. And my response is, okay, fair enough, but I don't. It's not low, and I don't believe the CPI. I think it's a lie. And they say, well, you know, GDP growth is really strong. And my response to that is, okay, yeah, it is, but the government is spending two trillion dollars a year more than it's taking in, and government stimulus, whether it creates value or not, adds to GDP. So. Like, do we really have a strong economy or is the government buying the answer they want? And then, you know, they'll further say, well, you know, unemployment is really low and the jobs numbers are great. And my response to that is the jobs numbers are lies and the jobs that we're seeing, there's been no growth in full-time employment in years. All of the job growth is going to people who weren't born in the United States and it's all part-time job growth. That's So you don't have people, you don't have more employment. You have the same people working more jobs to make ends meet. And so these really smart strategists are saying the economy is in great shape. And my response is, no, it's not. We have a bifurcated economy, right? If you're wealthy, you're well positioned for inflation. If you're working with the government or for the government, you're in terrific shape. But most of the country, I think, isn't doing so great right now. I think people are living paycheck to paycheck. They're suffering from inflation. They don't believe that food prices are up only 1%. Their grocery bills are killing them. Their fuel bills are high. Rent hasn't come down. You know, And, and I'll admit, I've been wrong on the direction of real estate prices. When interest rates went up, I thought housing, shelter, those prices were going to come down. Now they have, and we've talked about why, and, and that's fine. But you know, I, I thought that would happen. Um, but my view is we have a bifurcated economy. You have a small number of people doing really well, pulling up the averages, and a large number of people that are struggling. And so that's what we're seeing with Target. Target, you know, which it's generally the less affluent people or the middle class that'll be shopping there. Their latest earnings report showed declines in food sales, discretionary sales. Customer traffic was down almost 2% in the quarter. It was not a good quarter. And our view is that is largely because of inflation. People are struggling. Uh, you know, when you need to take on two and three part-time jobs to make ends meet, you know, go tell those people the economy's in great shape. Yeah, you note, Gary, that watch sales tend to indicate a strong economy, right? But that doesn't appear to be the case, at least from your position. Um, we had Benny, Benny Moore on Vasco Assets a couple yeah. weeks ago as well. And I remember him talking and I know with working with him, right, uh, watches have been a big keen focus of theirs from an alternative investment standpoint. So why do you think that is? And is this a market, you know, when you talk about watch sales being up almost double, uh, one report UK based watches of Switzerland reporting, what's causing that dynamic? So that's exactly what we're talking about. And some of these watches might go for $50,000, $100,000, a quarter of a million dollars, right? I mean, you know, do you want to buy a watch or do you want to buy a Ferrari, right? Do you, do you want to buy a watch or do you want to put a down payment down on a house? Obviously, the people buying these luxury watches can afford that. They can afford to take the, the price of a, a high-end car or a down payment for a house, or in some cases, the price of a house, um, and use that to buy watches. And, you know, the answer is inflation is very kind to people who own assets and have the credit score that enables them to, um, to take on debt that becomes worth less. And so, you know, just as, as one personal example, 
because you know at deep knowledge investing we saw the interest rate issues coming we saw inflation coming we knew the fed was going to raise rates i refinanced my mortgage in the fourth quarter of 2021 and i was able to lock in a rate just over three percent and that's a 30-year fixed rate mortgage so for 30 years i'm going to be paying the same amount now try to imagine so i did this you know roughly three years ago around 27 years from now when i'm writing the exact same mortgage check for the same amount what do you think the hmm. the dollars represented by that check are going to buy not, not very much. little <laughs> right very little so what happens is when you have a lot of inflation the value in dollars of hard assets will go up right so the the value of property goes up but your debt is denominated in dollars and so right. i i get to own a house that will be worth more in a high inflation environment, the dollar price of it will go up if I ever go sell it. But the debt that I have against it, my mortgage is also denominated in dollars that are depreciating. When you have enough money to do things like that, you can make a really bad system work for you. If you're not spending all of your money at dealing with rent, food, you know, fuel, uh, basically the, the cost, just the cost of living, you can do things like buy Bitcoin, buy gold, buy stocks. Um, those are things that do really well in an inflationary environment, but you have to have excess assets and excess income to take advantage of it. And so again, this is why I think we have a bifurcated economy. It, and, and I want to point something out. A lot of people will criticize me for saying that I'm cheering for this. I am not cheering for this. I, I think what we have is unfair, it's wrong, it's harmful, but my responsibility as the head of deep knowledge investing is to work with people and protect them from this. I'm not cheering for this. I didn't make it happen. I don't want things to work this way, but for our clients, for our subscribers, it's our job to find ways to make all of this work for them. And that's what we do. Um, if I were designing the system, I would design it differently. We'd have hard currency, we'd have no inflation. And I think that would get us a better, more fair, long-term outcome for the country. I can't control that. So please don't think I'm, I'm cheering against people, that I'm against anyone, that I want people to suffer. I don't. I, I think the system we have right now is bad. It's wrong, but it's my job to figure out how do we make it work for our people, you know, for our, our clients? And I'll also point out that doing things like buying gold or buying Bitcoin or buying stocks doesn't harm anybody. We're not taking money away from anybody. We're simply going up against other people with assets and making better asset allocation decisions than they are. In office, out of office, um, in good office. market, bad market. We're, we're in the game no matter what. So uh, thing number four, Gary, as we move forward, uh, your favorite company, shockingly, um, that was added, might not be telling the truth about non-financial goals. <laughs> yeah, they're not. They're lying to you. Was this, so, our, was this our polarizing topic? This is it. Week? Yeah. Right. We told Andrew, go find us something more polarizing. He came back with this and like, great, you know, yeah, wow. terrific. Great. Yeah. Next, next week, we will not be taking on immigration and abortion, right? I mean, this is... Andrew went and found the the most controversial subject in finance. Um, yeah. But, you know, good for him. We told him to yeah. do it and and he did. Um, yeah. the, the man does good work. So this week, Morgan Stanley published a survey of 300 large companies mm -hmm. with revenue exceeding $100 million. And they asked them about their non-financial goals. Those are typically referred to as ESG, environmental, social, and governance. And part of social, of course, is DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And half the company surveyed came out. They said, we believe that sustainability and social goals are significant value creation opportunities. So they think that by doing this stuff, or the, do they think that or do they say it, right? They're going to create value. And some of them correctly said that having these socially popular policies help them get access to capital entice new investors. Okay. I, I believe that. Um, but you know, the results of the survey seem clear. I have some questions whether these companies believe what the survey says. I don't think they're being honest. And then my direct question back to you is how much does the market even care 
about things that might not be profit related or have the companies given up on trying to tie and correlate these efforts towards profits? Well, I think the market cares when companies lean so hard into these things that they they tick off their customers, right? We all saw, you know, last year when Target was offering, um, mm. you know, transgender stuff for little children, people got angry. They said, wait, yeah. this is not appropriate for five-year-olds. Uh, you know, we, Bud Light got their sales obliterated on the same topic, although there were no children involved. Let's give them credit for that. Um, you know, Disney is in the process of ticking off a lot of their customers because they've gone all social narrative. But here's the key thing. I, Rob, I think there are two issues with this survey. One is we question the methodology of only including the largest companies. They have the room to do this even when it doesn't work. The best example I've got is Ford has lost billions of dollars pursuing electric vehicle plans. The press mm. loves it. The press loves that all of these legacy automakers are producing EVs, but those cars are not popular with customers. And so it's cost Ford billions. As one of the world's largest automakers, Ford can stomach those losses. But if you're running a smaller business, you make one mistake like this, you're out of business. It is a giant problem. The second place we challenge these companies or this survey is I think there's a difference between what people will say in public or to somebody conducting a survey and their real behavior. And so here's the great example on that. Somebody comes to these companies and they say, hey, you know, what do you think about ESG? Oh my God, fantastic. It's a great opportunity. But here's something, you know, over the last year, when faced with some financial challenges, Zoom, I'm, I'm quoting here, they recently laid off their entire diversity, equity, and inclusion team. Google and Meta, formerly Facebook, they cut their DEI programs after promising to grow them. Uh, ESG employment in the United States is falling. So these companies like to come out in public and say, we're committed to these non-financial goals, but at the first sign of trouble or where it's starting to cost them money, they cut those programs. Now, here's my thing, right? It's, it's an I hate this expression, but it fits. If you're going to talk the talk, walk the walk. These companies are saying, we believe in these programs while they're cutting funding for those programs. You know, So either the survey is wrong or their behavior is wrong. I'll leave it to you to figure out which is which. Interesting. Interesting. Definitely let us know what you think in the comments. I'm sure we'll have both sides of the aisle chiming in on that one, as we'd hope. And I'm really excited for all the commercial real estate bros that will be in my mentions after this next segment that we love to highlight about commercial real estate. Gary, thing number five to wrap up the show, the problems in commercial real estate are getting worse and it seems like have continuously got worse over the last couple of months. Yeah. All right. So this is something, as anybody who's a regular watcher of the five things knows, we've been talking about this for a while. Now, before everybody spams the comments and gets upset about it. I don't think that the problems we're seeing in commercial real estate are going to take down the whole market. This is not like the leverage play in residential real estate from 2008, but it is bad and it is a problem. This week's example, buyers are the highest tranche of debt for 1740 Broadway in Manhattan lost more than 25% of their investment. Now, is that a lot? Does that matter? Who cares, right? Why is that a big deal? Well, if you're an equity investor, if you're a stock investor, losing you know 25% in a stock, it's not good. You don't want it to happen, but we see that all the time. We see stocks go down 25%. It's not an uncommon occurrence. Um, but these were the highest tranche of debt holders. These guys are typically investing in securities that are rated very close to treasury securities. So you know, if this was five-year paper, it, it might have been yielding something like, you know, 4%. And so when you're trying to make 4% and you lose 25%, <laughs> there goes your year, <laughs> right? You, you can get wiped out in this. And the thing that makes all of this really, really uh, challenging for people is there were five tranches of debt. So what that means is the equity holders got wiped out. The four lowest tranches of debt got wiped out, went to zero, and the people who owned 
the you know near treasury grade securities at the top lost 25% plus of their investment that's bad and so the headline here is you know this these debt holders lost 25% and people are like okay is that a big deal well yeah it's a big deal when your equity gets wiped out and when four of your five tranches of debt get wiped out and your you know near treasury grade securities take a gigantic loss this is indicative of a giant problem uh, we've heard rumors of some sort of DC bailout for commercial real estate. What does that look like? And I think I know the answer to this, Gary, but is it a good idea? Yeah, I, I am I am strongly against it. And, you know, this goes back, Rob, to the stuff we were talking about when we were doing the segment on um, Target and watch sales. And I'm making the point of saying, you know, this economy, it it is rigged for a small number of people and doesn't work for a large number of people. And, you know, I'm making the point, hey, don't blame me for this. But, you know, what we're, I think, about to see is a Washington, D.C. bailout of commercial uh, real estate holders of the banks. That would be a disaster. It is a huge problem. It shouldn't happen. It would be wrong. And, you know, it's if, if you see it and it makes you angry, I'm with you and you should be angry about it. People in capitalism should not be bailed out. Capitalism and good asset allocation decisions have to come with the possibility of failure. Bad decisions will and should have uncomfortable outcomes. And so to have a situation where you have a group of people where if it works out, they make money. If it doesn't work out, the taxpayer bails them out. That's that's abusive. And it mm. really should be stopped. Uh, I'm, I'm against it. And just to give you a sense of how bad the analysis in the space is, uh, there was a collateralized mortgage-backed security strategist at Barclays. Yeah, I'm I'm giving the name. I don't care. Said, I'm quoting, these losses may be a sign that the commercial real estate market is starting to hit rock bottom. What? <laughs> what in the world? Your equity holders got wiped out. Four or five tranches of debt got wiped out, sent to zero, 100% losses. Your highest tranche takes 25% losses. And this guy's saying, well, you know, the market's hit bottom. What are you kidding me? Like maybe, but this is not evidence of it. This is evidence that things have actually gotten worse from the last time we were talking about it. So, you know, my view is be careful in the space. Uh, again, we're not cheering for anybody to, you know, lose a hundred percent of their money, but if they do, because they made bad decisions and the deals didn't work out, we do not want to see more bailouts. Uh, you know, my concern too is, you go back to 2008 and you had um, Occupy Wall Street, which I think I think that was a flawed movement in a lot of ways, but I will give the Occupy Wall Street movement credit for one thing. They were completely nonviolent. They took up space. They made life a little bit inconvenient, but they, they were nonviolent. My concern, Rob, is at this point, if there's another bailout, if the banks get bailed out or the commercial real estate owners get bailed out while people are living paycheck to paycheck, I, I hope this doesn't happen, but I could see things going way past nonviolence. Um, it would make people very, very angry and understandably so. Uh, again, I don't want to see the losses. I don't want to see the ballots and I don't want to see violence, but this is stacking up to be a really bad situation for a lot of people. Interesting things happening all across the board, as always with deep knowledge investing, the five things will keep you in the loop of everything you need to know and to make sure you can make the proper moves throughout the market. Uh, this was our the most important issue ever issue. Uh, Gary, thanks for the tongue twister. Uh, any closing thoughts that you have? Uh, as always, thank you for watching. We love subscribe, uh, sign up for our newsletter, free version, consider a paid version, refer your friends, or just leave us a comment like uh, would go great as well. Gary, closing thoughts. Given that we're filming, uh, today on Memorial Day, uh, I want to share a personal story uh, with you. My grandfather was a very brave man. He fought in World War II with the U.S. Army, uh, the 80th Airborne Division. He was a paraglider, saw heavy action through France and Germany. Um, his family situation was a little bit rough. He was the sole source of support for his family and could have avoided military service when he was drafted. And... Um, I asked him one time, I said, why, why didn't you do that? Like, why choose to go to war? And he knew the stakes and he said, I wasn't going to let someone else defend my family. I mean, brave man, great integrity, great character. He 
put himself at risk to fight for what he believed in. Um, fortunately, he came back uh, ha happy and healthy, lived a great life um, with you know children and grandchildren who adored him. But some of his friends did not make it back, of course, and we should remember them today. One of the things I used to do uh, when my grandfather was alive, every Memorial Day, I would call him and I would you know, remind him that we would not be celebrating him that day. And he loved getting that call because it was a reminder uh, of how grateful I was that he returned from fighting in World War II, that he returned safe and happy and healthy, um, and that I was so grateful that we were not celebrating him or remembering him on Memorial Day. He loved getting that call. I loved making that call. Um, for those of you who have uh, service people, servicemen, service women, um, veterans in your life, give them a call today if they're still alive. Um, let them know you appreciate their service and tell them you're glad that you're not remembering them today. For those of you who have served and lost friends, family members, um, colleagues, you know, I'm so sorry for your loss and, you know, take a minute to uh, be thankful for the sacrifice that they've made on behalf of the country. Uh, Deep Knowledge Investing does have military veterans on our board and uh, their contributions to our firm are incredible. And um, yeah, that's it. Just take a minute to be grateful for the freedom that we have. Thank the veterans that you have in your life and, you know, realize that they had friends and some of you have family members who have made huge sacrifices and, you know, we're sorry for your loss. And um, thanks so much for watching today and for giving me the chance to share, uh, you know, one of my uh, personal family stories.